This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Good evening and welcome. My name is Lauren Reynolds and as an alumna of UC San Diego, it is my privilege and my pleasure to be here tonight. I was thinking about how much has changed since I started here at UC San Diego in 1990. None of these buildings were here. The number of students was about 12,000, less than half of what it is today. And I was thinking about the tuition. <laughs> The tuition was $1,800 a year. For my parents, who had my brother at Harvard at the same time, it was an incredible bargain. But it was no less of a quality education. It was a great place for me to learn. It launched my first career in broadcast journalism, a 17-year-long career, 15 of those years, at 10 News here in San Diego. And it helped fuel an entrepreneurial spirit, which I have today. I am one of those American small companies. I have 54 employees and growing. So I'm very happy to be here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> tonight, you will hear from six outstanding faculty members who will highlight the life-changing research happening every day here at UC San Diego. And they will share their inspiration for why they do what they do. Before we begin, it's my pleasure to introduce UC San Diego's eighth chancellor, Pradeep K. Kosla. Today, he was formally invested as UC San Diego's eighth leader. And since his arrival on August the 1st, he has been making connections across the campus and in the community. He has also initiated a collaborative and inclusive strategic planning process to develop a shared vision for the future of UC San Diego. So please welcome Chancellor Pradeep Khosla. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. It's actually amazing and I actually fully expected to see alumni like Lauren do so well and then come back and do the introductions. So anyway, I'm here. It's indeed a great honor for me to be here. I'm really excited about uh, the chancellorship and I'm looking forward to what we're gonna achieve. But this evening is not about the chancellor. This evening is about the core of UCSD, which is the intellectual, the brain trust. And as Lauren said, you're gonna hear from six of the top people six of the 500 top people or 1,000 top people, not, all the, not just the top people. But this show is really uh, my executive vice chancellor, Suresh Subramani's show. It's on the academic side. So I just want to say thank you for being here. And I want to hand this over to Dr. Subramani, our executive vice chancellor. Suresh. Well, thank you, Pradeep, and congratulations. I also want to acknowledge this beautiful auditorium, uh, uh, the, the Radio School of Management, and thanks to Bob Sullivan, and more importantly, to the bystanders who, who contributed to making this a bystander auditorium. This is the first such big event that we've had uh, in this auditorium, and I think it's spectacular. I should tell you that this event is completely uh, f full in the sense that there are also people in an adjacent room should they be coming in late. So, uh, so today we are celebrating the UC San Diego founders, but we're also celebrating the investiture, as you, as you heard. So we had a series of events that, uh, uh, this afternoon and also last night. But uh, today, the event that we're going to celebrate is really uh, 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 answering what our faculty do and how they inspire us, uh, just as the founders did when they started UC San Diego. 
a few years ago, starting with our 50th anniversary, we started a new annual tradition, which I hope is going to be here to stay, because every year we outdo ourselves. And uh, so the first year we had uh, all our Nobel laureates uh, talk about uh, their work and, and how they've inspired the faculty. Last year, we, uh, I, I used the opportunity to talk about new research initiatives that we were uh, unfolding for the next decade to put UCSC on the map. And today we want to showcase, as you heard Lauren say, the, some of our faculty and the diversity of the work that they do. And I'll come back and say a few, few words about this. So at, here at UC San Diego, we believe that by creating and applying new knowledge, we can change the world. And we integrate our research, education, and, and development of technologies and therapies to dissolve the boundaries uh, that separate life and the study of life itself. We also believe in our public service mission, and that is that everything that we do has to have some kind of societal impact. So you, you will hear about how our faculty are tackling some of the world's most challenging problems and trying to do this in a way that also encourages our students to think about the same so that when they go out as citizens of the world, they, are, uh, 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 they have the same spirit in which uh, they try to tackle the problems of the world to create effectiveness. And this all goes back to the theme that Roger Revelle and Herb York, our first chancellor, uh, uh, initiated, and that is to be distinctive. Uh, we are not going to do everything under the sun, but everything that we do does have a value uh, that uh, affects and transforms the world. Uh, so uh, uh, as we talk about interdisciplinarity, you know, this morning I had an opportunity to talk to some of the founding faculty, and many of them said that the thing that Roger Revelle and other leaders inspired them to do is that this was going to be the campus that would beat out Chicago and Yale and Harvard and every other place because of its interdisciplinarity. And it's wonderful to hear those stories, and I hope you see that theme uh, through this series of talks that you're going to hear about today. So uh, we've assembled an exciting panel, of, of, and, and in fact, as I look at the challenges that f face me on a daily basis, what keeps me going is the accomplishments of the faculty and the staff and the students, and this, these are truly inspiring stories that continue to inspire us in education, our impact on the world, uh, as well as, uh, uh, as an ex uh, example for our students to emulate. So with this, I'd like to turn this back to Lauren to kick the program off. Thank you, Chancellor Kosla and Executive Vice Chancellor Subramani. Now let's get started with our program. Ada Almuteri joins us tonight as director of the UC San Diego Center of Excellence in Nanomedicine. Her research group, the Laboratory for Bioresponsive Materials, creates novel smart materials for on-demand drug delivery, regeneration of damaged tissue, and safe image-based diagnosis. She'll explain to us this evening how she and her colleagues build materials from atoms and molecules that fall apart on demand. And the impact of this technology. Please join me in welcoming Ada Almuteri. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm a chemist operating at the nano and micro scale. What that means is that we build small, exquisite objects. Uh, objects that are programmed, they're exceptional because they're programmed to dismantle on demand. And uh, these demands that we place on them are to dismantle by remote control, and also to be discerning enough to recognize the beginnings, the earliest stages of disease. What I mean by that is the molecular beginnings of a disease, the molecular signs, at a, at a stage where the physician or, the, uh, or the, the patient themselves are not able to feel or see this disease yet. So um, what I want to impress on you today is that those that view the world through a molecular lens are well positioned to tackle some of the problems, the major problems that, fa that we face today. Um, so these small, exquisite objects, uh, we package inside of them diagnostics and therapeutics, both to protect them from the body, but also to protect the body from them, and to control their function. So that on demand, on remote control, we can tell them either to um, begin their activity, their therapeutic act activity, or to tell us where there's a disease site. 
Uh, we're particularly interested in inflammation. So some of you may remember this cover of Time magazine in 2004. Inflammation is linked to the beginnings of diseases such as heart attacks, cancer, Alzheimer's, and a variety of other diseases. So what we do know about the biochemistry of inflammation is that um, in the beginning, there is a small imbalance in chemicals known as uh, reactive oxygen species. It's a really small imbalance, and so it's very difficult and challenging to see this. Okay. Um, so the story of I mean, so clinicians um, and pharmacists and such don't have imaging tools to see these very weak molecular signals. I want to tell you a little bit about the beginning of imaging. So imaging actually began uh, a little over 100 years ago when Wilhelm Röntgen, he's the first Nobel Prize laureate in physics, was just curious about this energy form and its interaction with matter. When he discovered x-rays, he didn't think that it would revolutionize medicine, as we now know. Um, and he, more profoundly, it completely changed the way we view ourselves and the world around us. So since then, there has been a succession of advances, and that what you see in front of you is the uh, energy that we get from the sun. It's called the electromagnetic spectrum. It's just different energy forms. And so since then, we've been using almost every wavelength on this spectrum, every energy form on this spectrum, to better understand the world around us and to also uh, understand disease. And it's after we understand disease, we can begin to treat disease. So what if I told you that there is um, a type of light form on this energy spectrum that is underutilized in medicine and has potential to really transform um, medicine? This energy actually lies between the visible light, that's what your eyes can see, and infrared light. That's the light that's used in your remote control to control your television. And it enjoys properties from both sides. It can travel through our bodies, so it gets inside our bodies. It's harmless, it doesn't change anything. But it also has properties of visible light. Visible light is responsible for photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is how we get our food and our fuel. And so we dare to imagine, can we make this form of light um, useful in medicine? Can we do chemistry inside living systems without having to open them up? Because this energy can travel through uh, living systems. So this, for example, laser is green light, and it doesn't travel through my thumb. If, when you go home, try a red laser and see how it'll travel through your thumb, and you'll see it. And that's the difference in, in, in these energy forms and their ability to travel inside. So what's holding us back is that this energy is um, very gentle, and there are only few chemistries that can do something with, uh, molecules that can do something with this energy. And so that, that's what is a common thread between early detection of disease. We're trying to see very weak molecular signals and using this type of energy. So we took inspiration, actually, from the electronics industry. In the 1980s, IBM had developed this technique called chemically amplified photoresists. This is what allowed us, today, allowed us in the 80s to have our own computers and bring them into our house. It's really transformed our society that way. So this is how it works. So mankind, mankind has always been able to amplify weak signals, and this is how chemically amplified systems work, and this is our, our inspiration, our design. So we, we uh, strung together uh, molecules into a strand. It's called a polymer. It's like a spaghetti strand. And this polymer is designed to be unstable. The molecules in this polymer, there are millions of molecules strung together, and they're designed to be unstable. Now, we stabilize them with these groups, these chemistries that we know will come off when encountering this type of light and when encountering molecules, the beginnings of inflammation. Okay? Then what happens when only one of those molecules that we have on there comes off, it triggers a cascade of reactions that reverberates through the strand and disassembles the entire strand into small, millions of small molecules, entirely dismantling the polymer that we built. We take this polymer and we build from it small, exquisite objects, like I said, to package diagnostics and therapeutics in there. And so when the polymer is completely dismantled, the entire object, the small, exquisite object, disassembles on command. So 
We were able to show that, that with this type of light, these objects are dismantled and the therapeutic and the diagnostic is released and we can control its function and we can detect diseases. We've used it also for inflammation. We've received a lot of press. This, these are actual pictures of the particles that we build and how they are punctured with this type of light and with early, early signs of inflammation. So this is a short 30-second uh, video to show you how these systems can be used. Um, so the uh, we use MRI agents. We build MRI agents with these small exquisite objects. We inject them into uh, living systems. And they begin, they're smart enough, discerning enough, to recognize the biochemistry of disease inflammation at its earliest stages. Uh, here we have early signs of inflammation, and these light up and tell the physician that there's something wrong here. This biochemistry is off. OK, please check our website out and email us with questions. And thank you very much. I'm sold. <laughs> Seth Lehrer is a distinguished professor of literature and dean of arts and humanities. His research and teaching interests include medieval and Renaissance studies, comparative philosophy, the history of scholarship, and children's literature. Tonight, he'll discuss the history of reading, the technologies of literacy, and the social impact of literature and language. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is a great pleasure to be here. My laboratory is the library. But because I work in a library, it does not mean that my work does not have a social impact. My concern is the relationship between literacy and technology, how changes in the media of communicating literature and the ideas of the mind have a direct impact on the nature of those ideas and what I call our vernacular consciousness. When I work in libraries, I encounter strange and rare things, like this scroll from ancient Greece. In the Greek, the Roman, and the ancient Hebrew traditions, you did not write in a bound book, you wrote on a scroll. And scroll writing is very different from book writing. It cannot be accessed, if you will, at random. You must open it up. Scrolls are large things. They were used for the storage of canonical literature. Homer, Virgil, the Torah in the Hebrew tradition. Now, if you were a student and you were sitting in class, you couldn't write on a scroll this large. Instead, what you worked on was this tablet, a set of wooden boards covered with wax, and then a stylus. And you would take notes on the wax, and then you would transfer it or memorize it, and then you would melt the wax again, and you would reuse it over and over and over again. And so think of this as the ancient version of a kind of etch-a-sketch or blackboard in which you could have information conveyed to you in a temporary way. These boards, when they were bound together, were called something called a codex. A codex is a bound volume. The early Christians in the first centuries of the Christian era realized that codexes, bound books, were smaller, cheaper, easier to hide than the large scrolls that were used for Greek and Roman and Hebrew texts. And also, they signaled a fundamental difference in the ideologies of reading. A Christian book is a book like this. A Roman book, a Greek book, a Jewish book was a rolled up thing. And the Latin word for that rolled up thing is a volume. So when we talk about volumes, we talk about rolled up things. What can you do with a bound book that you can't do with a scroll? St. Augustine, the great father of the Christian church in the year 394, talks about how he was converted finally to true belief. And the way he was converted, this is a much later picture, 
But the way he was converted is this. He tells a story that he was having a crisis of faith and he picked up a copy of the scriptures and he threw himself down underneath a fig tree in a garden and he opened the book at random and he read, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in lust and wantonness, not in quarrels and rivalries. And as he says, I marked the place with my finger or by some other sign and I closed the book. You can only do that with a bound book. And Augustine's point, and my point as well, is that it is the physical medium of literacy that is inseparable from the personal experience and social meaning of the text. The transitions from the scroll to the bound codex not only affected the physicality of reading, it affected the ideologies and the ideas of reading. Once you bound an Old Testament and a New Testament together, you could do what was called figural or allegorical reading. You could open the book into the Old Testament and read a story of a father and a son walking up a hill with the son carrying a load of wood on his back ready for sacrifice. And you could put your finger in that place of the book and then flip ahead to another story of a son walking up a hill with a load of wood on his back waiting to be sacrificed for his father. This is allegory, this is figural reading, this is the essence of Christian understanding, and it could only be done with a bound book. Under this rubric, I talk about the manuscript. The word rubric comes from the Latin word meaning to write something in red. And in medieval manuscripts, what you wrote in red were chapter titles or headings or important things. And in the 14th century, the great Italian poet Dante began his book called The New Life in which he says, in that part of the book of memory, which is the first one which is possible to read, one finds the rubric, here begins my new life. Dante imagines memory as a bound book, and he imagines the chapters of our memory rubricated by the scribe of the imagination. And this compels us to think not just of memory as a book, but of the world as a book. At the end of Dante's Divine Comedy, he says, looking at the spirit of the Godhead in paradise, in its depth I saw going inside, bound by love into a single volume, that which before had been expressed as scattered pages throughout the universe. The world is a bound book. And what I'm getting at is that throughout the history of Western literary culture, books provide us not only with the media of understanding, but with the metaphors of our imagination. Technology is not simply the bearer of ideas, it provides us with imaginative ideas. And so, when we see ourselves now in a comparable moment of literate transition, scroll to codex, or had I enough time, I could tell you about the transition from manuscript to printed book. We now live in an age of transition from print to digital literacy. What is the relationship between digital literacy and our habits of reading and reception, writing and the imagination? Throughout history, once the bound book became the norm, one quite literally could curl up with a book. Bound books are cradled, they are engaged with. When you read, you look down. What I would say is that the experience of reading a book is absorptive. By contrast, when people started to read on screens, the experience was what I call theatrical. That is, you did not look down, you looked out. You did not cradle the book in your hand, but you looked out at the screen. It generated a different physical engagement with texts. This different physical engagement deeply affected the way in which we think of the text, the way in which we access literature, and the way in which our cognitive processes engage the eye, the head, the hand, and the heart. And so it may not be an accident that in our digital age, what we look for is a simulacrum of the book, a recreation of the experience of curling up with something that we can look down at. That is, we have now the e-reader, and these e-readers have names like Kindle, and nook, the Kindle that kindles the imagery of intellectual fire, and the nook where you curl up 
in the back. And as I say this, I must take at least 30 seconds to say that at this moment, I find myself channeling my grandfather's voice, thinking where he says to me, where'd you put the Kindle? Is it in the nook? And I have this image <laughs> of this e-reader as emboldened with this notion of a man who came to this country who sought to kindle as an experience, not as a nook, but, or let me put it this way, can we have the St. Augustine moment with a kindle? Can you be inspired in the way Augustine was with the electronic text? Let me look back a few years when I was teaching at another university up north. In 2004, I received this email from a student and I reproduce it exactly. Prof Lehrer, on my way out to class today, I got a piece of glass stuck in my foot. It was bleeding and hurting a lot, so I had to come back and clean it up. Sorry about the absence, but I'll get the notes from someone. Apologies. Right, sure there are misspellings, bad capitalization, all of them hallmarks of an email style designed not to mime speech, but to create what I call the illusion of intimacy. Email articulates a studied informality, a carefully framed indifference to the rigors of epistolarity. <laughs> I have a PhD. I just want you to know that I can say stuff like that and get away with it. And when I teach my undergraduates in Ravel College, I talk to them and they ask me about these things and I say, you have to understand I am bilingual. I am bilingual in English and in PhD. And so <laughs> I read this and because I have a PhD, I thought to myself, Prof Lehrer, on my way out to class today, I got a piece of glass stuck in my foot. It was bleeding and hurting a lot. So I had to come back and clean it up. Sorry about the absence, but I'll get the notes from someone. Apologies. I could not but think of William Carlos Williams' great poem of 1919. <laughs> This is just to say, I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which we were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were so delicious, so sweet, and so cold. <laughs> Both this student's email and William Carlos Williams' poem are in essence notes tacked onto the kitchen walls of life. They are essays in absence, and they are both letters of apology. We live in a world of apology. How could we not explain what linguists call uptalk, the way in which every sentence now ends as if it were actually a question? And because we are constantly apologizing for what we're saying, we are constantly living in a world in which the digital does not enable the emotive, BRB, be right back. D-W-P-K-O-T-L, deep, wet, passionate kiss on the lips. G-G-N, <laughs> gotta go. This is actually a transcription from actual texts I have received. I-L-I-C-I-S-C-O-M-K, -I, I laughed, I cried, I spilled coffee on my keyboard. And <laughs> T-2-U-T, talk to you tomorrow. These may seem risible, but they are exactly like the ancient cuneiform texts. <laughs> in which we use ideographic signs, in which communication is designed to be coded. If there is a future for communication in the digital world, what I would say is it will create a codified, stratified way of communicating. Communicating would be code. Communicating may no longer be, as it was for me, the experience of complete sentences. I could used to be able to put my finger in a book. I could bring a book to class and show a student that William Carlos Williams wrote a poem about stolen fruit, and that Augustine throwing himself underneath the fruit tree was as figural experience as stealing plums from an icebox. These days I walk into a class with my Macintosh and I realize that the bite out of the apple is now not succumbing into sin, but a taste of knowledge digitally richer than anyone imagined. And I'd like to believe that up there in heaven, Steve Jobs is looking down <laughs> and finding that it is good. Thanks, Seth, and I mean T-H-X. <laughs>
Steve Mayfield is the co-director of the Center for Food and Fuel for the 21st Century and the director of the San Diego Center for Algae Biotechnology. Tonight, he'll discuss how both food and fuel are derived from photosynthesis and how by using design for purpose photosynthetic organisms, we have the opportunity to develop production platforms for fuel and food that have unmatched efficiencies and productivities, which will be required if the world is to rise to our standard of living. Steve. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> and, I, and I know now I have to be very careful about any emails I ever send Seth. Um, so, so let me start, you know, I, I was gonna talk tonight um, about fuel and, and peak oil and how energy is equated to our economy and all of the problems associated with it. But I've spoken three times in the last few months that Chancellor Kosla has been there and by now he must be so sick of that talk that I decided instead I'm gonna talk about the little things that we do in lab but maybe how the little things we do ultimately can change the world. So what I'm gonna tell you about, I'm gonna tell you about food and fuel and why we think about it, but then I'm gonna tell you about how rainbow-colored algae can change the world. But let me start with food and fuel, and why do we think of these two things together? We think of these two things together because chemically they're the same thing. So both are chemical energy. The energy in a substance, that can be released by a chemical reaction to do work. So we can eat a Big Mac and hop on our bicycle and ride down to the university. Or we could go buy a gallon of gasoline and put it in our car and we could drive down to the university. So we can accomplish the same thing with both of those. But in fact, in this country, we take a fair amount of our food, about 40% of our corn crop this year, and we are gonna turn that into 40, 14 billion gallons of ethanol, and we are gonna blend that with our gasoline. So in fact, we do take food and turn it into fuel. And I couldn't find the exact chemical composition of a Twinkie, but I am pretty certain that is somebody who's taken petroleum and turned it into food, <laughs> okay? Okay, but beyond that, not only are they interchangeable to a degree, they actually come from the same thing. So fuel and food are the products of the conversion of sunlight energy into chemical energy by the process of photosynthesis. So what photosynthesis does is it takes CO2, it pulls it out of the atmosphere and in a set of complex reactions, it turns it into sugar, it releases oxygen, thank God for all of us, and it turns that into carbohydrates and proteins and lipids or fats. And clearly you recognize those as food, as the things we eat. But in fact, all of petroleum is simply ancient algae and all of coal is ancient plants. So these are simply fossilized photosynthetic products. So in fact, 70% of the economy, and that is fuel, and that is food, and that is chemicals that we make from petroleum, are in fact simply photosynthetic products. That's why it's so important. Now over the last 50 years, we've had enormous productivity increases in food yield on this planet, right? That was brought about by something called the Green Revolution, and here's just a couple of examples of that. This happens to be wheat production in India, but you could look at any grain, you could look at any agricultural production, and what you'd see is over the last 50 years, we've doubled or tripled, or sometimes those have gone up eightfold, okay? We did that without increasing the number of people working on the farms. In fact, they've gone down dramatically. We did it by, without increasing the amount of land, we did this by mechanizing agriculture. But that comes at a cost. That comes at a cost that we've got to get a lot more tractors, we have to put a lot more fertilizer on this, and we have to use a lot more energy. So another way to show this is this slide. And this is a little bit of an alarming slide if you think about the history of mankind. And what this plots is production of energy, that's the blue line right there, over the last 10,000 years. But this could go back much longer than that oil and coal built up over the last 300 million years. We have simply exploited them really just for the last 100. And then overlaid on top of that is world population. So what it's pretty clear to see is that what we've done really well over the last 100 years is take petroleum and turn that into unprecedented production in agriculture, and that has allowed world population to hit the seven billion people we have on the planet today. So where the real issue comes is, well, what do we do now, as fossil fuels start to decline, 
And we're not in any stretch going to run out of them, but what they are going to do is get more expensive. And that's the real issue, okay? This is a plot of the price of corn over the last 30 years, plotted against the price of oil. And as long as we were producing oil very cheaply at $20 a barrel, even though we were using a huge amount of that for agriculture, it really didn't impact the price. But starting in about 2005, as the price of oil really started to go up, then it became a significant component of food. And now the price of food and the price of fuel spike together, right? So when we had that big, big spike in oil in 2007, up went the price of corn. When we had the big spike that we're having right now, back up it comes again. So our real challenge is how are we going to very efficiently turn photosynthesis into the products that we need for the future? And now what I'm gonna show you is, okay, that's the big picture, but now what I wanna show you is a bit of the little picture, a bit of the stuff that we do in my lab that someday is gonna impact this, okay? So why do we think about algae for this? There's really a variety of reasons, but the most important ones are that it's very efficient in photosynthesis. Much better than any plant out there, you can turn sunlight and chemical energy into products, we can go to very large scale, and it's got an enormous diversity. Diversity means there are lots of different algae out there and we know how to manipulate them so we can do engineering and we can make all kinds of products. We can make food, we can make fuel, and we can make wrinkle cream. And that, this is a wrinkle cream made from algae. But what I'm gonna tell you a little bit about now are some of the products that we've made, okay? So the first one we made, or the first set that we made that I really like are rainbow colored algae. So here's the genes we put in. That one's called blue fluorescent protein, cerulean green, and we have blue algae and cyanobac cyanoalgae and green and yellow. And so I know what you're all thinking. When will these be available in a store near me, and will they be in time for Christmas? <laughs> Probably not, and that might not be what you're thinking. You may be thinking, what does this have to do with food or fuel? Well, I would argue that if you can make rainbow-colored algae, you can make anything, right? <laughs> and we have made just about anything. Right? But they're also a very powerful tool, and in fact, the Nobel Prize was given to Roger Chen here several years ago for developing these because we can do lots of really cool things with them. Here we've looked at simply different parts of the cell, the nucleus, the mitochondria, the chloroplast, all with different fluorescent proteins, okay? But here's another one product that we've made. This one is very interesting. It's called mammary-associated amyloid protein. This comes from colostrum. It's one of the first things that mom puts out. All newborns get it. Right? And what it does is that stimulates mucus production in your gut. So here's wild type algae, it doesn't make that. Here's two transgenic lines, they make serum amyloid very well, mammary associated amyloid very well. And what that protein does is when you eat colostrum or you eat the algae, it stimulates mucus production in your gut and that gives you a physical protection from bacterial and viral infections. So why is that important? That's important because the number one killer on the planet is actually bacterial diarrhea. It's dehydration of kids. So this project is now funded by the Gates Foundation. We produce this algae, we send it back to a group in Nebraska, they put it through pig trials, and what happens is when the pigs eat this, stimulates mucus production in their gut, you get some bad water with some bacteria in it, you don't get bacterial diarrhea, you continue to put on weight, and in fact, we're gonna launch a, a company with this very soon. <laughs> but after we made that, we said, well, let's make some more sophisticated proteins, and the next one we made were malaria proteins. So here's simply two different algae making two different malaria surface proteins. These happen to be called PFS 25 and 28. You can get antibodies against those. And here we can see that the antibodies recognize them, so we know we're making the right protein. We purified those from algae, and then we injected them into mice. And we did that so we could have a malaria vaccine. And what this shows is here's the malaria parasite with sera taken from the mouse that we injected with those algal proteins. And they have antibodies now in that sera that recognize the surface antigens on this malaria bug, <laughs> just the same way that this malaria monoclonal antibody does. So we know we're recognizing the right thing. More importantly, we can actually take the blood from those mice, we can feed it to mosquitoes, and we did this in collaboration with Joe Vinets here at the med school, and when those mosquitoes eat the blood that have our vaccine in it, what happens is those mosquitoes no longer propagate the malaria bug. So we've got a malaria vaccine, and I'm gonna show you one last one really quickly, which is once we got there, we said, well, what's the most expensive drug out there? And the most expensive drugs out there are these very fancy magic bullets in cancer. So they have an antibody domain and a toxin domain on them. And there are several of these that are going through clinical trials. They work really well, but they are very expensive. One of them that is coming onto the market now is $160,000 for four doses. 
So we said maybe there's a chance we could make these in algae and greatly reduce that price. So we tried a couple different ones. We tried one that just had a single antibody binding domain, and then we made another one that had two antibody binding domains and two toxins on it. And this is the last slide I'll show you. So this is the antibody alone. It does not kill the cancer cells. Here's our single-headed one, kills them very efficiently. Our two-headed one kills them even better. And when we inoculate those tumors into mice, we can actually cure those mice of the tumor. So with our little guy, we've managed to make now three different, very, I think, exciting potential drugs for the future. So the last challenge we have is how are we going to get this to really large scale? This is an energy company that I started here it's called Sapphire Energy. This is their production site down in Columbus, New Mexico. It is now 100 acres of algae. They are growing this to produce bioenergy, but this same process can be used to produce any of the compounds that I just showed you. And I'll end it simply by saying that we are the San Diego Center for Algae Biotechnology and Food and Fuel for the 21st Century, and you can follow us on those websites. Thank you for your attention. Aren't the topics amazing? Yeah. You feel like you're learning a lot? Quickly, too, we're on time. I want to remind you, if you have any questions, please jot them down on your index card, and somebody will just walk by. You can just hold it up and pass it maybe to the end, and they will pick it up for you. Our next speaker is Amanda Datnow. Amanda Datnow is a professor and chair of the Department of Education Studies. The education research happening at UC San Diego takes a headlong look at the critical skills our nation's teachers need to prepare successful K-12 learners in the 21st century. Her presentation tonight will focus on this research and teacher education and show how UC San Diego is having an impact in local schools by putting this research into practice into the classroom. Thank you, Lauren. As Lauren mentioned, one of our jobs in education is to try to figure out how can we educate young people for the future so they can go on and do the kinds of exciting work that you heard about today. It's a challenge. Um, today I'm going to talk particularly about the preparation of teachers, and it's actually fairly serious information. So I'm trying to think about how I can work an angle and it's going to make you laugh or um, lose fat and so on, but it may not be that kind of talk. <laughs> So um, I'm going to begin this presentation by inviting you to share the urgency I feel about the need to create high-quality K-12 teachers. Um, and I'm going to end by telling you what we're doing here at UCSD to put research into practice. OK. So in schools across the US, we have teachers who are busy trying to prepare young people for the future. However, many of the methods that we see in use may not be preparing kids for the kinds of things they will be facing. We know, for example, that students need to become 21st century learners. They need to have um, skills in collaboration, communication, creative problem solving. They need not only literacy in reading and mathematics, but also digital and information literacy. Um, and these skills are required not just for them to be successful citizens when they grow up, but really for them to help us tackle problems of global importance, the kinds of things you heard about today, really pressing issues that we're facing in our future. And so quite simply, these kids, my kids, your kids, grandkids, the kids in our nation's schools, these kids are our future. At the same time, we're finding ourselves with a rather narrow talent pool to move us forward. And this has equity implications, as well as implications for our competitiveness in a global economy. So I'm going to share with you some enrollment data that have been um, published by a center at UCLA called IDEA that helps to monitor enrollment patterns in our state. So when we look at this graph, we see that the pipeline narrows considerably from ninth grade to college with only about one quarter of the students in our state even having completed the coursework, the A through G coursework, we call it, required for entrance into the UC or CSU. The numbers are even more sobering when broken down by ethnic group. California's population, as you know, is one of the most diverse. More than half of the children in our um, public schools are Latino. And yet, only 16% of Latino students complete A through G courses, in large part because the schools they attend oftentimes don't offer them. The numbers for African-American students are roughly the same. Approximately 6% of these students enter the, the CSU and about 2% enter the UC. Yet we know that a growing number of jobs are going to require a college education, yet we have very, you know, relatively few students who are prepared. So what does the research tell us about how to better help better prepare young people for the future, in K-12 education specifically? There are a myriad of answers, and I want to begin first by describing some systemic issues in our state, some of which you may be familiar with and some of which you may not. 
Um, California ranks among the lowest in per pupil funding in the US. This translates into larger class sizes, larger counselor student ratios, which you see here, and a lack of resources in schools, especially schools serving low income students. So schools with the largest number of poor students have the greatest shortages of textbooks, the lowest numbers of qualified teachers, and attend the state's most overcrowded and run down schools. So this contributes to some of the inequities that you saw on the previous slide. So especially with a set of systemic conditions in our state, which are gonna take some time to address, the role of teachers is critical. And that's one of the levers we're working on in terms of improving the education system in our work here at UCSD. Teachers are especially crucial contributors to student learning, and yet their job has become more complex and demanding. They need to help students gain 21st century skills and reach increasingly complex um, curriculum standards. They need to educate an increasingly diverse population of learners to achieve at high levels. And in doing so, they need to kind of put aside a one-size-fits-all approach and tailor instruction to be, meet students' individual needs. This is probably the most challenging part. So in order to be effective, teachers need to know cutting edge pedagogical practices that are informed by research. That's part of the work we do here. And they need to know how to draw upon evidence to make complex educational decisions that affect students' lives. Anyone has had, who has had a child in school knows that such decisions are not light matters and can have dramatic consequences for students' self-concept and their academic development. So we want our teachers to be developing the talents of all students. And this isn't always happening, right? So what must we do in teacher education to support the kinds of learning that teachers require in order to undertake this job with some hope of success? There are a variety of myths about how teacher education should occur. And I want to begin by dispelling a few of them before I get into the research. These include anyone can teach. All they need to know is the subject matter. Fast alternative routes to teacher education are just as effective as rigorous university programs. And most teaching skills can be learned on the job. As national expert Linda Darling-Hammond explains, much of what teachers need to know to be successful is invisible to lay observers, and, th and leading to the view that teaching requires little formal study. And yet we know from decades of research that this simply is not true. However, these myths have led to frequent disdain for teacher education programs. Um, under pressure um, from opponents, we've seen more weak programs launched in recent years, and teacher attrition has increased. And many alternative routes into teaching deny teachers of much of the knowledge base they need to be good teachers. Even more worrisome is that these teachers often find themselves in the highest need schools where we believe the most sophisticated understanding of teaching is actually needed. There is a robust knowledge base about the components of highly effective teacher education. Um, this information has been summarized in a report by the National Academy of Education's Committee on Teacher Education. So here are some of the things we know. We know that coursework and highly successful programs must be coherent and carefully sequenced. Courses need to be tightly interwoven with students' work in schools, in partnership schools, especially in schools that serve diverse learners effectively. In this way, people learning to teach are exposed to strong models of teaching. Teachers need to develop not only knowledge of the subject matter, but also content pedagogy. So not just math, but how to teach math effectively. And they need to develop inquiry skills so that they can continually interrogate their practice that they, or problems of practice that they encounter in their work. And they need to do this individually and with colleagues. So teachers need to become classroom researchers, not just teachers, but classroom researchers and expert collaborators, in part because the job of teaching has grown so great that it, that it cannot be mastered by any one individual. Teachers need to work together. So as a leader in teacher education, UCSD is putting these ideas into practice. It is a UC-wide mission to engage in teacher education that is informed by research. Our programs are designed to be small, rigorous, and research-based. It's different than what might be happening in other programs um, in other places. Um, in our program, students learning to teach spend a great deal of time in classrooms, often beginning by um, working as tutors and mentors in our Partners at Learning program called PAL. This is the largest service learning program here at UCSD. Uh, we we um, engage over 500 students per year who contribute 20,000 hours of volunteer time in our local schools. And these students gain practice only in underserved public schools. You can see a map of our partner schools here. The majority of the schools we serve are south of the 8th Freeway. We also serve some schools in Oceanside because we're interested in working with um, kids from military-connected families. 
when students move through our program and move into student teaching or internships, we also involve um, schools in Escondido and Vista as well, schools that serve the same population of students. We have always been committed to serving underserved schools. That's where we do our work. That's where the need is greatest. Here are some photos showing our UCSD students working with children in the community. In our courses, students learn about educational theory and best practice in education. What we want them to do is put these ideas to work in engaging kids in meaningful learning activities. So here, for example, you might see students engaging um, kids in hands-on activities in math and science, in the arts. Um, they take these courses through the PAL program as well as in other courses in our education minor program. So we offer a general education minor as well as education minors in science and math education in partnership with the UCSD Division of Physical Sciences. Because what we're really trying to do is increase the pipeline specifically of math and science teachers. We also have a special focus on bilingual education. We are working on increasing the number of teachers who have expertise in um, a number of languages, but most specifically um, Spanish and, and American Sign Language, where we have nationally and regionally known programs. Many of the students who complete our education minor programs then go into our year-long credential program when they graduate. Um, after the coursework in the minor and in this program, our graduates have completed typically four to 600 hours of classroom experience, during which they're also volunteering in our schools. And this contrasts with the 50 hours they might experience in an alternative certification program. And we know from prior research that this extensive supervised clinical practice, particularly the part that they receive in the credential program itself, makes a tremendous difference in terms of expanding their toolbox for teaching. I mentioned the, all the skills that teachers need to know. This type of work in schools is what helps them build those skills. All of our graduates who complete a teaching credential also complete a master's degree, which helps them demonstrate their skills at linking research and practice. In some cases, our partner schools and districts actively seek out our graduates when they have positions available. And we know that in, the, in these schools, our graduates, when they work together, they have sort of a critical mass effect. They're highly effective in working together, they become teacher leaders, and they help to transform these local schools into centers of educational innovation. In other cases, our graduates are hired into schools that are already innovative, and they help to support and grow that focus through the training they've received. Our strong partnership with the Poi School is one such example. We are pleased to report that the vast majority of our UCSD teacher graduates are hired within a few months of graduation. And this is really impressive given the particularly tight job market right now, which has seen the number of positions decline statewide due to budget cuts, um, as well as rising class sizes. And we also know that our graduates stay in public ed education, often for the long term. Many of them also return to us for future education in our doctoral programs. So in sum, I'm gonna close by letting you know that at UCSD what we're working on doing is bridging research and practice, bringing best, the best research evidence to bear as we have grown and refined our academic programs in education. Through our 40-year history, we have educated thousands of teachers who have shaped the lives of millions of children. And, and you'll notice that the skills of pro creative problem solving, collaboration, and inquiry that we want our teachers to develop are very much the same skills that we want our students to have in the future. And while we're very much focused on the future, we're also very concerned about the present. So I invite all of you to um, visit the Department of Education Studies here, come and dialogue with our faculty, attend our lectures, um, speak with us about the teaching and learning issues that you're facing in your community and the ones that you're concerned about in the 21st century. Working together, we believe we can make a difference. Thank you. So yesterday I was thinking about the national debt I really was, because I was thinking about how different the world was in 1990 when I started at UCSD, so I Googled it. It was $3.2 trillion. Manageable. <laughs> Less than a, a fifth of what it is today. And that brings us to our next speaker. Valerie Ramey is a professor and chair of the Department of Economics. Tonight, she'll discuss what history can tell us about the potential effects of two varying paths options faced by governments in many industrialized nations of either adopting additional stimulus programs or reducing taxes and cutting spending. Welcome. Thank you. I'm a macroeconomist, and I've been spending quite a bit of my time recently trying to answer this question. Can the government spend us to prosperity? Well, anybody who hasn't been asleep during the last four years knows that this is a pretty important question for public policy. 
So in 2008, 2009, we had a lively debate about whether we should have a stimulus program to get us out of the recession. And in fact, they did pass one, almost a trillion dollars. That died down a little bit, and it wasn't debated as much during the election. But the day after the election, we all woke up with a little bit of an election hangover and said, oh my gosh, the fiscal cliff is less than two months away. If no laws are changed on January 1st, government spending is going to plummet, and taxes are going to rise really significantly. And the question is, is that going to throw us into a recession? So where do we get this idea that the government spending is somehow linked to the economy? Well, we get it from John Maynard Keynes, who in 1936 wrote, when involuntary unemployment exists, wasteful, meaning deficit spending, may nevertheless enrich the community on balance. Pyramid building, earthquakes, even wars may serve to increase wealth. He went on to say that when there's high unemployment in the economy, the treasury should take banknotes, stuff them into bottles, throw them into abandoned coal mines, fill it up with rubbish, and let free enterprise work. Firms will hire workers from the unemployed, go dig out those banknotes, and the economy will thrive. <laughs> That's the essence of Keynesian thinking. That is what is behind what it's in our undergraduate textbooks, and it's what most economists in the Obama administration believe. So the question is, is it true? Well, it's really difficult to test this idea. Now, ideally, we would have the IMF conduct a randomized experiment on the countries of the world, right? <laughs> Increase government spending a little bit here, decrease it there, send in some simple statisticians, we'd have the answers. Nobody will let the IMF do it, so we have to somehow tease it out of historical data, and that's where my research has gone. To give you an idea of why it's so difficult to do, let me go to the recent history from 2007 up through 2011. So at the end of 2007 and early in 2008, we began to get an indication that the economy was going into recession. So we had the Bush tax cuts passed in February 2008. The rebates were sent out in the summer, but the unemployment rates kept increasing. TARP was passed in October 2008. The unemployment rate kept increasing. The Obama stimulus was passed in February 2009, but the unemployment rate kept increasing. They spent it. The unemployment rate stayed high. It's come down a little bit, but not much. So if we took some very simple statistical analysis, we might conclude that an increase in government spending raises the unemployment rate. But we know that there's what we call reverse causality. So the question is, how do we tease it out? So my research analyzes the effect of large changes in government spending that aren't the reactions to recession. I'm trying to get the causality out of this research. And it tries to answer the question, what is the government spending multiplier? Now, where could I get this kind of data? Well, if you look at the US, this is federal government spending. The blue line is defense spending, and the green line is the total spending. Now, this doesn't include Medicare and Social Security, which are a different kind, those are considered transfers. Now, those red lines there are the beginning of wars or major military buildups. So we have World War II. We have the Korean War, and it was the start of the Cold War. We had the Vietnam War, the Carter-Reagan buildup after the Soviet Union went into Afghanistan, and we have 9-11. Now, there's little tiny wiggles in this, but you can see the important movements are military spending. So my research put together, first of all, taking the data back to before World War II, uh, looks at this statistically to see what happens to the economy when there's military spending, because most of the increases of military spending are due to some kind of event overseas. So it's not a reaction to recession. And I do in-depth analysis doing case studies. So let me give you an example of one of the case studies. And I should say, when I did this also, I, it's really important to understand what firms and consumers are anticipating. And you can't get that from the kind of data that the government publishes. So I had to read Business Week every week from 1939 to the present to figure out what they were doing. It was a lot of work. It took a lot of time, but it was absolutely fascinating to sort of live through history. But with my 2020 hindsight, I knew how World War II would turn out. I knew that <laughs> the Allies would win, but of course they didn't, so that was a really neat part of it. So one of the case studies I did was what happened during World War II with unemployment and government spending. So 
1939, the unemployment rate was still 17%, and this is despite FD, you know, Roosevelt trying to spend us out of the uh, depression, we still had very high unemployment rates. But then they really came down to about 1%, at the same time government spending went up. So a lot of people remember this in the back of their head, they said, yes, government spending can get us out of recessions. Well, my more detailed analysis figured out the following. Unemployment, total unemployment went down by 9 million people. But one of the key reasons it did is because the number of people in the military went up by almost 12 million. It was the draft and the conscription that was a key process for reducing the unemployment rate. So overall, what I found was government spending multiplier is probably less than one. That means that when the government raises spending, it lowers private spending. Government spending does lower unemployment, but only by increasing government employment. I can't find much evidence for private employment. Okay? So this research has been having an impact on academic circles, which is always nice, but it's also having an impact on policy circles. So I've been traveling a lot, and last year I went and was on a, pan a special panel for the Congressional Budget Office talking about my research, and I got a nice thank you note from Douglas Elmendorf, who's the director of the Congressional Budget Office. And the thank you note said, Valerie, thanks so much for presenting your research on fiscal multipliers at the recent meeting of our panel of economic advisors. Being able to talk with you directly advanced our thinking important ways. Indeed, right after the meeting, we adjusted the estimates of the effect of fiscal policy that I presented in testimony last week and that we published in our regular review of the ARRA. And so when you see the Congressional Budget Office estimates also for the fiscal cliff, they've uh, incorporated a lot of the estimates that I had in my research. Now he says, I look forward to seeing you again at the NBR Fiscal Conference in a few weeks. That conference was last December in Milan, and it was very nice. We spent two days talking about the dire situation of both European countries and the US. So after two days of that, we all had to go out and have a little fun in Milan. <laughs> so Doug Albendorf is second from the left. That's me. The one at the end was my advisor in graduate school, Robert Hall. He's also the chair of the Business Cycle Dating Committee. So he's the one that decides whether we're officially in a recession. And after all of that dire fiscal talk, we had to have a little bit of Italian Prosecco in order to forget our fiscal worries. <laughs> Okay, there has to be some questions after that one, so write them down, <laughs> send them to the side. Our next speaker is Todd Coleman. Bio bioengineering professor Todd Coleman will discuss a new technology developed in collaboration with colleagues in the Neuro Integration Laboratory, a wireless sensor embedded in a temporary tattoo that can pick up relevant information from the human body allowing wireless monitoring of vital signs and brain signals useful in a wide range of applications. Professor Coleman will demonstrate a few of the seemingly endless possibilities of this emerging technology. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, I thought perhaps the best way to sort of explain uh, what I do is uh, by, telling, uh, by telling a story. And so uh, what you'll see tonight is a, is a story uh, which starts with, um, <clears throat> which starts with a, a friend of mine I went to college with and his wife, uh, so here's my, wife, my friend Fareed and his wife uh, Rana, and here, uh, here they are and she's pregnant and Fareed sort of grew a, a beer belly to sort of empathize with her throughout the process of being pregnant and everybody's happy and everybody's joyous as they're awaiting, uh, awaiting their two twins actually. And so, uh, but next what we see is perhaps not so uh, happy of a picture and so here is Rana at about 24 weeks and it turns out that as you know being pregnant with twins uh, typically they're born uh, born prematurely and uh, at uh, 24 weeks she was beginning to have uh, serious uterine contractions and so she had to go to the hospital and be on bed rest uh, for 10 days and it was uh, a very uh, worrying sign because as you know if a baby was born that early there'd be all sorts of uh, crazy problems. Uh, what you also notice about this picture is that Rana is very uncomfortable and that's in part because of this clunky technology and these belts that have these sensors on them. It's difficult for her to move around, as some of the moms here know, particularly trying to monitor the, the fetal heart rate becomes a big pain. 
And moreover, uh, when Rana went back home after she was um, uh, uh, on bed rest for 10 days at the hospital, uh, she was worried in, in, on many occasions because there's not too many technologies that can monitor the status of the fetus to understand if it's under distress or to understand what's going on with heart rate or other sorts of issues. And so uh, what my research uh, group sort of was taking a look at more generally was trying to understand why is it the case that it's very difficult for us to have a ubiquitous uh, sort of uh, you know, health monitoring technologies. And the reason is in fact pretty, uh, pretty uh, there's a serious contrast. On the one hand, we have biology, which is a sort of soft, uh, curvy linear and elastic, whereas on the flip side, the building blocks of uh, electronics and sensors are semiconductor wafers, uh, and they're, they're sort of flat, rigid, and planar, right? And so speaking of politics, this is like Democrats and Republicans, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> food for fodder for discussion afterwards. So, uh, uh, so, so you might ask yourself, okay, well, how can I get around this problem? And it turns out one way that you can get across uh, this problem is uh, by taking a semiconductor wafer uh, that's doped with all the circuits and whatnot on it and peeling off a very, very thin layer. And it turns out if you peel off anything and make it thin enough, it becomes bendable and flexible, including silicon. So you can take off a very, very thin layer of silicon with the right type of procedure and then mount it onto something that naturally sort of integrates with biology, like a piece of band-aid material, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then what you can accomplish are uh, flexible electronics. So um, with that, uh, myself and my collaborators, including John Rogers at the University of Illinois, we embarked upon uh, trying to see if we could put sensors and integrate them with the skin that can naturally bend with the skin while still acquiring bo uh, bodily signals of interest. And so what we were able to accomplish uh, in a paper that we published about a year ago in science is uh, what we call uh, epidermal electronics. And so what you see in this picture right here in the background is the skin, and in the foreground you see this sort of electronic circuit type of material, but notice that it naturally compresses and stretches with the skin. Okay, and so moreover, uh, the title of my talk is Tattoo Electronics. Well, it turns out that that little sort of elastomer, that flexible material, you can make that flexible material a temporary tattoo. And so what you see right here is a temporary tattoo, the school where I used to be, uh, Illinois. And uh, underneath here, you see, here's are the electronics that have been integrated with the tattoo. And after I mount this onto the skin, the technology is now completely concealed from the observer. And moreover, it's also concealed to the user because it bends naturally with the skin. So we now develop completely invisible technology. And so you might ask yourself, well, what can we sort of uh, monitor with this? Well, we can monitor a variety of things, okay? We can, um, first of all, there's a wireless antenna on here, so we can wirelessly transmit. There, we can sort of wirelessly transmit, uh, transfer power to the device. Uh, you can mount LEDs on here, light emitting devices. Moreover, you can put light sensing devices on here, so you can pick up uh, information about blood oxygenation. Uh, we can pick up temperature, mechanical strain, and also a variety of electrical signals on the surface of the body. And so as this relates to Rana and her pregnancy, uh, what we've demonstrated is that we can pick up signals reflective of sort of muscle movements, which would be important for uterine contractions. We can pick up uh, the, the EKG signal, which is important for not only Rana's heartbeat, but the baby's, uh, the baby's heart rate. And moreover, what we show uh, in this unpublished work is that uh, what you see in this red picture here is the original uh, EKG signal, and this blue one is what we've wirelessly transmitted. So we have a complete wireless solution that we're building. So the high-level idea at this point that we have is that we could take this original picture of Rana, where she was very uncomfortable, and replace it with a picture that looks like this. And so this could make uh, her time in the hospital that much more enjoyable, but moreover, we could also allow her, when she's back at home and uncomfortable, to understand a little more about the status of the fetus. Okay, so this is a collaboration with Sandy Ramos here at UCSD, and uh, we've uh, also won a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation project to advance the epidemiology of preterm birth. So um, if we stand back and take a look at uh, their two sons now, so here we have uh, Nikon and Ideen, and everyone is happy and smiling and whatnot, but as I mentioned before, it's quite common when you have twins that they're born prematurely. So the typical picture that you see when babies are born prematurely is something that looks like this, and uh, what many of you might sort of think about, when you think about premature babies, you think about the fact that perhaps the heart is not completely well developed and the lungs are not completely well developed. But it turns out that in terms of the ICU, those two issues have been uh, uh, addressed quite well. But it turns out that the key bottleneck right now with dealing with premature babies is dealing with their brains. And it turns out that it's quite common 
that because the vasculature is not completely well developed that they can suffer from strokes and moreover they can have seizures. And what's difficult about the seizures is the fact that it's not like in an adult where you can see from their behavior that they're having seizures. Rather, with these, uh, with these babies, there's absolutely no, no behavioral response that you can see. So as a consequence, it's quite common that they have to monitor uh, with these brainwave EEG uh, sensors on these babies' brains. But here's one of the problems. So one of the problems is that they need a certified technician in the hospital to scrub the baby's skin, apply the conductive gel, put the electrodes on the head and check the electrical characteristics. And guess what? Uh, these people work Monday through Friday, eight to five. So imagine what happens if a baby is seizing at midnight or on Saturday. So this creates a big problem. And so this led to our interest in seeing if our technology could be used to monitor you know, electrical rhythms of the brain. And so what you see in this picture right here is uh, myself. And what you see on the left hemisphere, <laughs> uh, just freshly shaven, bald head, right? <laughs> so. Uh, what you see on the left hemisphere is the, the EEG sensors as they're typically applied. So you have to apply conductive gel, put the paste, monitor the impedance, et cetera, et cetera. And on the right hemisphere, you see our epidermal electronics. And these things you literally just mount onto the skin. Okay? And so what you see in this picture right here, the top four waveforms represent what was picked up from the less left hemisphere using standard EEG. And the bottom uh, four uh, waveforms represent what we were picking up with our epidermal electronic systems. And at a high level, what you see is that there's no difference. And in fact, we uh, blinded this data and gave it to a certified neurologist at the Children's Hospital, and he couldn't differentiate one from another. And so this is joint work with uh, Mary J. Harbert, who's actually in the audience, and uh, she's the director of neonatal neurology, and we're very excited about this project to advance the needs of premature babies. And so <clears throat> if we stand back and take a look at where we were, what this means is that we could perhaps replace this picture uh, in the ICU with a picture that looks something like this. And this has the added benefit of, again, not only being of utility in the hospital, but perhaps also when the baby is at home, if we think about sudden infant death syndrome and whatnot. But moreover, there's another added benefit in that now this could facilitate the mother having skin-to-skin -skin contact with the baby while still monitoring their vital signs. And so now perhaps what I can do along with this story from conception to birth is now perhaps we can sort of walk along and begin to imagine how these tattoos might be a part of Nikon and Idine's life. And so uh, another project that we've been uh, developing uh, very recently is uh, we've been uh, trying to understand if we can, just with our little tattoo electronics, imagine if you could just mount a temporary tattoo right on your forehead and I could pick up electrical signals that are reflective of not just whether or not you're seizing, but rather of cognitive processes in your brain. Okay, and so what you see in this picture right here is imagine that, imagine that there's a, and this is quite common with the data deluge, what we have right now, we're always inundated with data, and in many situations, the first thing that we want to do is we just want to triage. What's important and what's not important? Or at least, what do I know is not important, and then perhaps I can investigate the rest later. So we designed a paradigm where you have a, a variety of things that are unimportant, which we call distractors, and a couple of these images that have faces in them are quote-unquote targets. And so it's well known that if you have a full cap of EEG with the gel and whatnot, that you can differentiate one from another just by monitoring the brain signals as you flash these images in front of them. And so what we were able to do is using sort of electromagnetics, cognitive neuroscience, and signal processing is we designed an electrode system, as you see right here, just on the forehead. And this is a signal that we picked up just from our electrode. And this is not average across many people. This is on an individual subject level where the black waveform represents something that's irrelevant to you, whereas the red signal represents something that's of an aha moment. And so we can robustly pick this up on individual subjects of statistical significance. And so we might ask ourselves, now that we can pick up brain signals reflective of cognition in a manner that's basically invisible to you, what types of applications could this create for Nikon and Idine? And so one of the things that we did, we we're very fortunate to get connected to some people in the Hollywood industry, and there's a company called Living Pictures who uh, have a very, very interesting technology. And they basically, in real time, render sort of Hollywood quality uh, animation. But the beauty about this animation is that there's actually an actor behind the scenes and there's a camera looking at you as you interact with the character and it's saying you know hey you with the glasses on look over my way or why are you bored or why are you not doing this and they're engaging you and it's unbelievably realistic and if you've been to the san diego zoo with your kids you might have seen this because it's on display there and it's unbelievable how uh, how how much attention this attracts from the children 
So we had the idea of trying to partner with these folks and imagine if we could, so here's Nikon here with some of the little tattoos on his forehead, and imagine if we could sort of uh, take children uh, as they're interacting with these characters and in a very subtle manner without the kids even learn it, basically test certain things about their learning and uh, apply images or, or auditory signals at the right point in time and by carefully tracking the time and whatnot and by monitoring their brain signals, what if we could differentiate the extent to which they're learning certain things? So this is a very, uh, very preliminary project, but we're very excited about these types of capabilities that this technology might enable. And so if we stand back and take a look at Nikon and Ideen as they age more so and more so, uh, we can begin to imagine how this technology could uh, be useful to them as they age. And so imagine if in the future, if one of them is sort of running with their dog and this sensor is uh, transmitting these signals wirelessly to their smartphone, it, it can identify that they're having a heart arrhythmia or they're about to have a heart attack, and this could directly signal the information to the ambulance. And as the ambulance is coming to get them, it can be sending the, the vital, si vital signs to them and also to their doctor who's waiting on them as they arrive at the hospital. So this is, uh, the, 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 and so this is in collaboration with many clinicians at Cal IT and the Telemedicine Center. We're really trying to turn the science fiction into reality. So the punchline uh, from all of this, as you see, is that we're trying to tell this story about how this can be a part of, uh, of, of Nikon and Ideen's lives as they grow. And what we're excited about is that this has implications from both the beginning of life to the end. And I think the, all the other possible applications are sort of uh, only limited by our creativity and our imagination. <coughs> so, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And, and lastly, of course, I couldn't do this with all the students and, and postdocs in our laboratory. So thank you. At this point, we're going to prepare for our question and answer period. So we're just going to redecorate a little bit. Sit tight. It'll probably take about two minutes. Thank you. OK, our first question is for Dr. Stephen Mayfield. Are the algae susceptible to disease? And if so, how do you protect against it? Yeah, so uh, absolutely they are. In fact, in agriculture, there's, there's only three things that you worry about. You worry about yield, you worry about crop protection, and you worry about a way to harvest them. And uh, yield is something that we, we always work on a little bit, but crop protection is something you work on every day. And so the same practices that work in agricultural settings also work for algae. So things like crop rotation, uh, actually, even some of the pesticides that were developed uh, for crops work very well on algae. Thank you. Ada, how has interdisciplinary research benefited the work done by any of tonight's presenters? Oh, tremendously. Um, I'll talk about my lab. I have uh, pharmaceutical scientists in my lab developing formulations. I have uh, engineers, chemical engineers. Um, the light technology that I talked about we're using to treat uh, age-related macular degeneration to prevent multiple injections for this treatment. So I have a chemical engineer that came to us from Caltech working on this um, in collaboration with the pharmaceutical scientist that develops the formulations and with a biologist that studies the cell response to these. Um, so that's about my lab. But, and I can also speak, I have a collaboration with um, Todd Coleman uh, and again, it requires biologists, engineers, chemists, uh, and pharmaceutical scientists working together because there are all these disciplines with these projects that take them from the beginning all the way to the end. Dr. Lair, are modern languages being destroyed by the rapid changes brought on by digital communications? And if so, how long will it take? <laughs> Let's see, what's today? Friday? <laughs> what I would say is that digital communication, like all forms of media, as I was suggesting, does not destroy, but it does stratify forms of communication. And I think what we're looking at is a situation not unlike earlier historical, that in earlier historical periods, where you have forms of vernacular expression that are keyed to different social or economic or professional or situational registers. And some of those may appear to be traditional verbal grammatical forms of expression, and others may appear to be coded or coterie forms of expression that uh, represent in a symbolic way 
the grammatical or verbal forms of expression. So I would what I would say is that our languages are not being destroyed by any means, but they are being altered, and they're being increasingly stratified. And literacy in the future will actually become a multiple rather than a univocal experience. In some sense, we'll all be multilingual. Dr. Datnow, please give an example of how a local public school is a center of educational innovation with a critical mass of UCSD trained teachers. Okay, um, well, I guess the easiest example would be the Proy School here at UCSD. They've hired 33 of our teachers over the years. Um, as many of you know, uh, the Proy School was recently named the top charter school in California. They are doing tremendous work um, preparing students for college. 90, I want to say 99% of the students um, are accepted to four-year colleges. These are all students who come from families with um, a income of under $40,000 a year with no parents who've had a college education. So they're doing tremendous work there. We work really closely with them. They obviously hire teachers from other places and, um, as well. But that is one spot where we're you know, seeing an impact. There's another school in the community that I can point to. Um, Faye Elementary in San Diego Unified um, is a urban public school where we've had a large number of teachers. They've been doing some tremendous things with kids. We put a lot of our students in there for training. Um, I know we have a big impact at the Riverside School for the Deaf outside of San Diego. Um, deaf education is an area where um, there's a great deal of work to be done. Tom Humphreys and Carol Patton, who are here, um, work in that area. And we have had several schools around the country hire a large number of our students and have really transformed how we do deaf education in a bilingual approach, which is quite novel and different. So. Thank you. Valerie Ramey. Does it make any difference if wasteful deficit spending money is distributed underlined? Two, workers on unemployment insurance, workers producing a product, workers providing a service. Um, yes, there is a difference between whether it's distributed as what's called a transfer payment, which would be, uh, say, the unemployment insurance, versus uh, spending it on say buying things from the economy. That was the second example. Um, the uncertainty bounds right now though on what the multiplier is are so large that they sort of overlap even though we have sort of some estimates. So for example with the transfer payments we have trouble seeing that leading to a significant increase in spending. With government direct uh, employment of people such as during World War II uh, we see a much bigger effect there than if they simply buy things from the, from the private economy. Too often when they buy things from the private economy, GDP will go up somewhat, but there is also some crowding out. So, so it does seem to matter which kind, but we're still trying to nail down which ones are the most important. What they're finding is that the, actually the biggest multipliers are on taxes. That, and in fact, Christina Romer, who was the first chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under Obama, has important research showing that tax increases actually reduce GDP much more than, say, a spending reduction does. So it does matter. Okay, Todd, the idea of the question is, could your tattoos be used with unconscious patients? Oh, that's a great question, wow. So we actually, uh, uh, in short, absolutely. So in fact, we are, um, have a collaboration with the chair of anesthesia where we're in the process of writing the the, to, to get the approval going, and uh, I didn't go into it here, but we, there's, a, a, there's a, a collection of different types of signals that are reflective of cognition that we've been able to reliably pick up with our epidermal electronics. The ones that I mentioned before are things that are reflective of um, sort of uh, what, you know, what, 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 what captures your attention and what does not, but there are different types of brain signals that are reflective of um, in some sense, do you perceive things as being uh, congruent or incongruent? And the consequences of that, some of which would be great for education, also could be great for understanding uh, how conscious someone is because you could deliberately provide auditory stimuli that you know uh, have, a, have a congruent valence or an incongruent valence, and you can uh, sort of by monitoring the brain signals alone, you can uh, understand uh, whether or not th this person is, their brain is putting them in the same file cabinet or in a different file cabinet. And so uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a project that we're working on right now. And you might have heard recently about some, something that just made the press just yesterday about persistent vegetative state patients and whatnot. So this can have 
implications uh, for, for those sorts of technologies. And I have a very personal connection to this because uh, my father, unfortunately, uh, died of uh, pancreatic cancer uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, one of the things that happens uh, towards the end is that they, um, uh, they're no longer able to sort of interact with you outwardly, but the doctor told us that the last thing to go was the hearing. And so I could imagine in many situations, if you could have some type of way that could guarantee to you that although this person cannot communicate with you, that by monitoring these signals, you know that uh, it's, you know, I'm 95% confident that he is aware of what we're saying to him, then when we tell him our last goodbyes, that uh, is, uh, you know, it makes us feel a whole lot better. So I have a very personal connection to trying to use this for that purpose. <laughs> Steve. Talk about the role of UCSD or any university as an incubator for the launch of companies, the intersection of academia and business. Okay, um, so I think th this is the one really large change that I've seen over the 25 years that I've been as an academic professor. And that, uh, you know, when I started in the business, the idea that we would have research funded at a university that would be transferred to a company was, was something that was bad. It was something we didn't want to do. And I think really only over the last 10 years, it actually started by something called the Birch by Dole Act, which then required all of us ivory tower boobs to actually take our research and attempt to commercialize it. And at first we fought that, but I think over the last 10 years, we have really begun to see that we can have a positive impact in the community. I can guarantee you the, the students in my class who come in, you know, they, they want to know what's on the test, and then they want to know if I have any jobs available in any of my <laughs> biotech companies, right? So I think we've really changed as a faculty over the last years to start to integrate this, and it's had a positive effect on all sides. Ada, can you monitor pressure in the eye, which is supposed to cause glaucoma? Yes, I believe we can do that. Um, all you need to do is to, in fact, uh, the last meeting that I came from last, um, this morning, we discussed that. You can have a mechanically labile group stabilizing that, that polymer, and um, any kind of pressure change would influence the mechanics, removing that um, stabilizing group, destabilizing and thus disassembling this, uh, the small exquisite objects that we make. Uh, and we have all kinds of sensors that could then light up and tell us uh, the pressure has gone up. So I would definitely envision that, yeah. Valerie, uh, it seems beyond, and I can't read this word, but it, it seems obvious that public employees eat, rent buy homes, drive cars, go to entertainment, et cetera. How do you explain your conclusion that public employment does not increase private employment? So that, that is a good question. To what it, so Keynes's idea was that you, know, you give some income to some people, they spend, and then it multiplies through the economy. The problem is that there are all these countervailing forces where you s simply get more crowding out. So for example, if the what people have found in numerous other studies is if the government spends more in an economy and say hires more worker in a particular area, they tend to draw workers from private companies into those companies. So, so that's part of the counter uh, balancing effect. Now, a lot of people are trying to do research on whether that effect is less when unemployment is higher. Do you draw more people out of unemployment? And there's some evidence that suggests that. In fact, I'm working on a paper now that I'm supposed to present in January where we're going back through historical data both for the US and Canada to the periods when you had very high unemployment to see if there really is a very different multiplier when you have high unemployment. So what I would say is your intuition is right if the unemployment rate is high. We're just trying to see how big that effect is. But in a regular economy, you can't get as much of a multiplier because you're crowding out so much of the private activity. Amanda, education and technology. How do you see technology helping teachers and education in general? That's a huge issue, and actually I should have addressed it in my talk. Um, we work very hard to help our teachers know how to use technology well when they're teaching, and, um, and to use it as a tool. But also, in, you know, one of the big moves in education is not just to use technology with students or to use technology as a tool to teach students content, although that's one of the things we work a great deal on, but also to 
help teachers do many of the things that I talked about, make complex decisions using data. So the big moves, actually my own research is on um, how teachers use data um, as a, in, in educational decision making. So technology helps a great deal with that, archiving different kinds of data so that teachers can track student progress over time in meaningful ways, make educated decisions. I mean, obviously they need to learn how to um, be data literate, but the technology piece is huge in both the, the content delivery as well as in the making educational decisions piece. This is a question for Todd. What is the power source for the tattoo? Uh, that's a great question. So as I mentioned before, you can uh, uh, deliver power to the device wirelessly. Uh, turns out that uh, there's unpublished work showing that you can embed a, an ultra-thin, uh, flexible uh, battery inside of the device. And so my guess is that depending upon the application, different types of solutions uh, will work. Uh, you can even think uh, more radically about imagining that you could perhaps since you're laminating this onto the body, uh, if there are sort of ch uh, heat changes, thermal gradients on the body, you could uh, uh, sort of use those for energy. Also, some of the mechanical movements on the body could perhaps be used for energy. So if we think about the future where uh, sort of the state of affairs goes, um, I think there's uh, going to be some unique opportunities. Uh, I think also this has created a unique uh, opportunity for us uh, because one of the things that we learned is that uh, if you try to use state-of-the-art uh, sort of wireless transmission technology right now, they're extremely uh, power hungry for continuous monitoring. So we actually went all the way back to the physics and sort of explored things all the way back from the 1960s to develop new, uh, uh, new circuits that are extremely power efficient and can withstand mechanical deformations and still wirelessly transmit. So one of the nice things about needing to be intimately coupled with the body is that it really forces you to go all the way back to the beginning and rethink things and understand things and develop novel solutions. Valerie, have you compared fiscal stimulus with the impact of austerity policies and what are the results? Um, I haven't, but I've kept up with a lot of, I go to all these conferences and people are talking about it. So um, fiscal austerity does seem to reduce growth in the short run in most cases, but there are some prime examples of cases where they undertook basically belt tightening, consolidation, and the economy actually seemed to, to benefit from it and grow. And in those cases, what people think is that a government getting its fiscal house in order so restored confidence in that government that people were more willing to invest in those sorts of things. Now, there's a huge debate because an IMF study is looking at, at these things and claiming that uh, GDP tends to go down in almost every case. Other studies say, well, no, in some cases it can go up. Most people agree that for long run economic health, governments need to get their, how, their fiscal house in order. The question is, should you do it when the unemployment rate is set, still 7.8% here or you know, quite high also in Europe? What they have found is, in general, the multiplier is bigger for the tax increases than for the government spending decreases. And people are trying to look at that some more, but it seems that you have less of a recession if you cut spending more than you raise taxes. You need to do both, but there seems to be that higher you know, negative effect of the taxes than in terms of the negative effect on the spending. Uh, Ada. Are you familiar with John Kanzius's work on cancer and the gold nanoparticles, and did this influence your work? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, so gold nanoparticles are considered hard matter. They're inorganic, and my specialty is in organic, soft matter. Um, but like any curious person, I follow these things closely, and. It was a, a very cute, elegant way to do things, and um, these are called the photothermal effects of gold, and we wrote a review on this, and yeah, I, I, I know quite a bit about it. <laughs> Here, here's another one for Valerie. I got it. Government spending is not the answer to reducing unemployment. What are some strategies that have proven successful to reduce unemployment? I'm looking at that now, uh, but I don't have the answer yet, but I'll tell you what I'm doing. So you might have seen in the graph that we've had fiscal cliffs in the past, in particular at the end of World War II, when after uh, VE Day and VJ Day, government spending just plummeted. 
but that the unemployment rate only went up from 1% to about 4.5%. And so what I just did for an uh, NSF proposal is uh, I started gathering a lot of data to figure out why the US economy didn't plunge back into the Great Depression at the end of World War II. So you'll just have to stay on hold for the, um, for the answer on that one, because <laughs> I don't know yet. <laughs> Seth, do you see major differences in how your students learn today versus earlier in your career as a result of the use of electronic media versus traditional texts? Absolutely. I started teaching in 1980. And there's no question that students learn, not only that students learn, they write differently. I think that the ways in which they compose English sentences is much different. I think the issues about spell check and other assisted, uh, uh, de assisting devices has changed students' attitudes towards language itself, uh, towards rereading, towards the cognitive and imaginative process. And I think that the two areas that I'm most interested in thinking about as both a teacher and a scholar are how do students read and learn in a digital community, but more to my personal interest, how do they imagine in a digital community? I'm interested in what will poetry look like in the future? I'm interested in what literature will look like in the future? And will the digital technologies that we have today and that are emerging tomorrow change the ways in which people express their imagination as well as the ways in which they try to express the world of experience? So my interest is not just in the cognitive processes and pedagogies of teaching, but in what the literary imagination is going to look like in a truly digital world. Todd, can you imagine a time when we might provide Stephen Hawking with a keyboard using tattoos that he can press by thinking? Yes, uh, that, uh, that's actually something that I did when I was, uh, that's a, that's a, well, <laughs> Let me be careful. Let me be careful there. So uh, this, you know, uh, what, what that's there, there's a there's a um, there's a research group uh, research theme called brain computer interfaces that uh, that was the title of one of my slides that sort of relates to that. The idea being that if you imagine squeezing your left hand, or if you imagine squeezing your right hand, or if you just by doing your imaginations, can we sort of uh, just through your neural signals acquire those? sort of, you know, run some statistical analysis on those and basically decode what you were thinking. And uh, that, that signal that I showed that we could pick up, uh, that brain signal reflective of cognition, people have, have used exactly those types of systems for, uh, for uh, people who are in Stephen Hawking state. And I think, in fact, Stephen Hawking himself has used one of these types of systems. So because of the capability that we recently showed that we can develop, people who are sort of locked in can now use this as a, as a, as a new communication uh, prosthesis. So, so that, that research uh, sort of uh, theme already exists, and that actually is what motivated me to build these sensors. Uh, when I was an assistant professor at the University of Illinois, we were building these technologies, and we actually were even able to, believe it or not, we were able to fly an airplane over the cornfields of Illinois just with your brain waves, and it was exciting. We had lots of fun by wedding engineering and neuroscience but what I, what I came to realize is that the bottleneck was wearing this clunky cap on your head. And so that's what originally got me interested in trying to develop a technology that was much more minimal that could still pick up brain signals. So it's all going full circle. Yeah. This one is for Chancellor Kosla. <laughs> <laughs> You're still on the hot seat. Can products produced by the university contribute to a significant income stream for a university? Can that happen without moral hazard? And so some uh, examples, cancer medical research in Texas. Vis-a-vis, -vis, I think. Cancer medical research in Texas. Uh, so I think, so I don't know if I heard the question right, but I think uh, one of, I think the primary goal of the university is to educate. But one of the goals as part of the education process is dissemination, partly through graduating students and partly through what Steve was talking about, creating companies. If you look at the history of this country, Google was not created because DARPA said, do this at a university and then go create a company. DARPA paid somebody to think about the next great idea, happened to be search, and this smart student thought, oh, I can some go out and make create a company and make some money, and turns out to be Google. And that, I think we should encourage, and I don't see any moral hazard in there. I think the moral hazard uh, or the ethical hazard would be if 
we start doing work just to create a company. I think that would be a mistake. We should always work to educate and to train, and then in that process, if something good comes out, like Steve's technology or like Ada's technology, I think we should be going out there and pushing it very strongly. Thank you. At this point, we have a few minutes left, and we're going to open up the audience to ask any questions. So if you'd like to raise your hand in the middle there. I don't think it, the Khan Academy, some people may not be familiar, um, it's a, the, the, a gentleman created a set of videos essentially and has now continues to create them um, to teach, you know, it started in mathematics but I believe he's gone on to many other subjects and correct me if I'm wrong on any of these things. Um, and many teachers actually out, you know, working in schools find them, find them to be useful tools. Um, some schools have actually adopted them. I heard of a, um, some schools in the Bay Area that have, that have you know, used it as part of their math curriculum. That said, it isn't something that we utilize in our teacher training. Um, there's some contention on this campus among mathematicians who are not in my department who might argue that the way in which math is taught you, you know, in those videos doesn't fit with what we know to be good practice in mathematics. So we don't engage with it. We know it's out there. No one in our department is doing research on that per se. But I have heard a little bit of rumbling among uh, faculty person, you know, for folks in math that some of the ways in which it's taught, math is taught, does not fit with what we know to be you know, the right kinds of pedagogical, pedagogical practices. So we're not, you know, helping our teachers engage with that necessarily. Over here. Would you, uh, Professor Ramey, compare the current situation with the Great Depression uh, and with the, especially the partial recovery that occurred through 1936 and the recession within the Depression in 1937 and 1938, which showed that that partial recovery was nowhere near complete. Yes, so the second sort of recession in the Great Depression, many people think was caused by the monetary policy then. The Federal Reserve was still quite new, and you know, as you know, Friedman and Schwartz blamed them for worsening the Great Depression at the beginning. And then at that point, they started worrying about all kinds of other things besides unemployment, and they started raising reserve requirements, raising interest rates, and so a lot of people think that that's what led to that second recession in the late 30s. In contrast, fortunately, Chairman Ben Bernanke at the Federal Reserve did a lot of his academic research on the Great Depression. So he learned from the mistakes of the Federal Reserve during the Great Depression, and the Federal Reserve now is doing as much as it can, but unfortunately they've hit the zero lower bound, which means he cannot push that interest rate any farther down. That's why we've had these more exotic things that have never been tried before, like QE1, QE2, QE3, all this kinds of things where they're buying mortgages, putting them on the Federal Reserve balance sheet, but um, the question is how much it's helping. So he's doing as much as possible, whereas the Federal Reserve in the Great Depression kept making things worse. Um, in terms of so sort of what you can see going forward from here, you have to worry a little bit because what we're seeing now is not that different from what we saw with Japan in the last two decades. Interest rates at the zero lower bound, deflation, they tried several government stimulus programs. They were building roads all kinds of places and couldn't seem to get much to happen. So, so we really need some new ideas for stimulating the economy. Yes, this is for Dr. Coleman. As you know, heart failure is somewhat insidious and fatal often. Uh, don't you think you could use your tattoos on the ankles to identify this even before the patient knows he or she has it? Uh, yeah, that, that, that's a great question. So one of my uh, graduate students, uh, Ridu Sinha, she's uh, uh, from India originally. Her dad is a cardiologist in India, and she used to run around with him back in India wearing his stethoscope and watching him as he treated patients. And so when she learned about our technology, she was very excited to come and work in our research group to address exactly that question. So we, um, we, uh, she is sort of taking the lead on taking, taking this project in that direction. And we uh, are working with a couple of uh, cardiologists here at UCSD. And also one of my buddies, uh, another one of my Michigan buddies, uh, along with the guy that was on the slide, is a, uh, it's an MD, PhD uh, at Harvard. And he's, he's a cardiologist and he's very interested in using this for those purposes. So the cardiology sort of angle is, is totally in play. 
Just raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, this is for Professor Lamy. Uh, back to the uh, economic issues again. Um, the, there are a lot of economists who say that the, uh, the, what's going on in Europe right now is a living laboratory that austerity programs do not work. Uh, would like your comment on that and your comment on what could we be doing that would improve our situation here in the United States right now? Okay. So on austerity programs, there's pretty good evidence that some of the slow growth in Europe is because they are cutting spending and raising taxes. But then you have to think about what the alternative is. And there we look at Greece, who let things that let things go completely out of control. So up through about uh, 2007, Greek interest rates on government debt were the same as the US. And so for example, they were very, very low, about 2%, 3% on long-term government debt. Through two th that Greece looked like a great case. Then they figured out what the long-term projections were for Greek government spending and taxes and debt. And Immediately, once people figured this out, Greek interest rates climbed to 25%, okay? They didn't get their fiscal house in order before. They have to do it now, because otherwise nobody wants to lend to them. It's having huge effects on the people of Greece. So the suicide rate is sky high. People are going back to barter systems, and they're paying a terrible, terrible price because they delayed the austerity. So what most people believe is you've got to get your fiscal house in order before things get out of control. You do worry about doing it, leading to a recession in the short run, but you can't keep putting it off or the situation will get much, much worse. It's sort of bitter medicine that you have to take, but you want to do it in a way that hopefully the recession is not too uh, steep. And what can we do now? I mean, it's, I, well, this is, a big part would be to try to do more health care reform, because right now the health care system is what's eating the U.S. economy. 18% of GDP is going to health care in the U.S. In European countries, it's more like 10%. The amount of money that the U.S. is spending on health care, both private and public, is equal to the entire GDP of France. We're a complete outlier in terms of the amount of our economy we're devoting to healthcare, and yet we have lower life expectancies than anybody else. So in terms of long-term structural change, we've got to make the healthcare system look more like the rest of the US economy. Get the Walmart principles into the healthcare system, and you can have just tremendous uh, innovation. The problem is that government law inhibits a lot of the innovation because the incentives aren't set right. So if people want to you know, say, what can we do about the economy? This is really thinking outside the box, but getting those incentives right so that you don't have so much wasteful uh, health spending is the way to solve the fiscal problem and get the economy going again. But it, you know, it's a long-term sort of thing. Okay, we have time for two more questions. Professor Mayfield, one of the challenges the renewable energy industry has faced for the last 30 years has been the fluctuating price of fossil fuels. It's kind of hard to know what to compete against because you don't know what the future price is going to be. Where do you see the biofuel industry going in, say, the next five or 10 years, given you don't know what the price of oil and other fossil fuels are going to be? What are the opportunities to build the technology and to prove it and to scale it in such a way that you don't depend on expensive petroleum in order to make a business? Right. So I, there's a couple of good examples out there. Um, one is sugarcane ethanol in Brazil. So when that started, um, you know, just, just like us, the, the energy prices were going up down there. They hadn't discovered their big oil fields yet, so they, and they were importing all their oil. So they made a serious commitment about 15 years ago to make sugarcane ethanol. And at the time when they started that, it was about $7.50 a gallon. And they spent 10 years and about $15 billion to develop all the research. And now they sell it worldwide at about $1.25 a gallon. Okay? So I think the path is quite obvious in the one sense that these technologies are viable if you're willing to make the long-term commitment to get them deployed. Our biggest problem is, as you say, the price spikes up to $150 a gallon. Everybody 
runs around and yells, why haven't you done something about fuel prices? They drop back down to 60 and people are, oh, we're back asleep again. Um, you know, the good news is, I'm sure many of you have seen this in the press lately, that we can be energy independent in, in the next 10 years. It's, it's probably true. We probably can be energy independent in the next 10 years. That's from something called uh, shale oil or tide oil. Uh, that cost $110 a gallon uh, barrel to get out of the ground. So we can be energy independent, but we're going to do that at about $140 to $150 a barrel. Now that's fine for us. It'll make our gas up about six bucks a gallon, but we'll get more efficient cars and, and we can live through it. And at that price, biofuels can compete. Uh, the best analysis I've seen says that we can make oil from algae at about uh, $80 a barrel. It's actually being sold right now up in San Francisco. Uh, they, they just yesterday announced that they're selling uh, algae biodiesel in a, in a company up there, Propyl Gas. Um, so these things are starting to come online now. And I think it's really just us having a little bit of patience and a little bit of foresight to say they're going to be expensive in the short term, but they'll give us a lot more options in the long term. My question is for Dr. Lehrer. Um, in your opinion, has the advent of digital communication and the generations who are going to be raised with it uh, placed them at a professional and or intellectual disadvantage? Well, I think it's less a question of disadvantage, and I think it's a question of, uh, of this. How can, how can we see in earlier historical periods how changes in the media of literacy have affected the ways in which the dissemination of information, the creation of institutions of the imagination, and structures of teaching have gone hand in hand? And I think what we see in issues in digital literacy and change are comparable to earlier periods of time from which we can learn where we can see, for example, the way in which the rise of the universities was facilitated by particular techniques of book production, or the ways in which uh, the role of cheap paper in the 18th and 19th century made possible the production of the multi-volume novel, or the way in which the public sphere around the coffee house or the public square changed the relationship between the word and journalism. So we're looking at comparable kinds of social intellectual and institutional changes. And the concern that I have as a teacher is that I think many of our students have such an instrumental notion of undergraduate education, that they go to college in order to be vectored into a particular profession or a particular job immediately, and that our understanding of social literacy, works of the imagination, and arts and humanities can prepare these students for far more flexible and far more adjustable careers and lives than simply an instrumental technical education. I think we confuse digital literacy with technology. It's another medium for the social imagination. And part of what I think I'm trying to do in the classroom is to show students that whatever their technical expertise or their technical interest, it is precisely this flexibility of imagination that will prepare them most effectively for a professional experience. I just want to add as a coda to that, my fantasy is that my students, as they're reading, have Todd's uh, sensors, and so that we can understand in so many ways, as some scientists are now trying to understand, what the precise mental processes are for an engagement with works of the literary or the artistic imagination. And knowing that kind of information, we can better prepare our students, not just for professional, but for truly imaginative lives. Good last word. I would like to thank you for joining us tonight. I'd like to thank our speakers. And if you would like to learn more about their fascinating work or more about them, we have um, more information on the Founders Symposium website, founders.ucsd.edu. And we've linked their bios and their web pages to that location. So thank you for joining us.